Hello, my name is Arnold Kailuber. I'm the Deputy Director of UN Environment's Law Division. Why should anybody care about environmental rule of law? Why is it important? Why are we talking about it? The rule of law is a very well-established principle of governance within the UN system. It basically is based on the premise that everybody is accountable to the law, private persons, companies, and the state itself. That these laws are not concocted behind closed doors, but they are publicly promulgated. They are then equally enforced. So nobody is above the law. Everybody is, as I said, accountable to the law. And then uh, finally, that these laws are independently adjudicated. Another very important aspect of the rule of law is, of course, that these laws must be in accordance with international human rights standards and norms. The rule of law has often been described as the fourth pillar of the UN Charter. I would say it's the foundation of uh, achieving the three big objectives of the UN, which is peace and security, human rights, and development. It is very difficult to see how one can achieve peace and security without the rule of law. It is very difficult to see how one can achieve development, fair and just development for that matter, without the rule of law. And it is very difficult to see how one can realize human rights without the rule of law. Environmental rule of law is, if you will, the rule of law applied in the field of the environment. Nothing more, nothing less. Environmental law has developed since uh, the environmental sea change in the 1970s uh, with uh, incredible speed, but also in incredible volumes. UN Environment is the leading agency uh, for, the UN, uh, for the environment in the UN system. Uh, has supported uh, governments and stakeholders uh, to determine and define solutions to respond to environmental challenges. And these uh, debates, these discussions have uh, worldwide triggered a, a, number, a wide number of uh, environmental treaties, hundreds of environmental treaties worldwide, uh, national legislative uh, developments in almost every country, and uh, associated with these legislative developments also institutional developments and a galvanizing of the civil society. There's hardly any country in the world right now that does not have an environmental authority, that does not have an environmental uh, ministry. This being said, if one contrasts uh, these uh, without a doubt remarkable developments with the situation on the ground, uh, with uh, scientific data uh, related to environmental degradation worldwide, one has to say that environmental law has still to uh, live up to its uh, full potential, that uh, environmental law at present does not yet yield its full potential uh, for people and the planet. And this is where environmental rule of law comes in. Uh, if you will, the rule of law and also, of course, environmental rule of law has a very democratic objective, meaning that everybody is treated the same before the law. But it also embodies uh, a governance aspect, an institutional aspect, uh, the, the sentiment that with the rule of law, the law can be made more effective, more efficient. And this is really ultimately what environmental rule of law is about. The first uh, mention in an intergovernmental setting of the term environmental rule of law uh, was made in 2013 at the first universal session of uh, UN Environment's governing body. And what triggered governments to highlight uh, the need for more capacity building in the field of environmental rule of law? Uh, what triggered governments to highlight the need for more investments into environmental rule of law? Uh, it is essentially uh, the rising uh, trend in violations of environmental law. Environmental crime is uh, the fourth largest form of organized crime uh, in the world, from illegal trade in chemicals, illegal trade in wildlife. Uh, environmental crime is increasingly heavy, uh, um, uh, creating havoc for uh, communities uh, worldwide. And so governments felt that the term environmental rule of law 
uh, creates an emphasis uh, to highlight the need to bring environmental law into the overarching uh, work around a rule of law within the UN, but also, of course, at the national uh, level. Now, um, environmental uh, rule of law uh, is, as I said, at the core, the rule of law applied in the field of the environment. But uh, nonetheless, there are, I feel, certain aspects that make environmental rule of law special, make environmental rule of law perhaps stand out. Following 2013, a UN Environment has engaged a wide number of partners uh, to build momentum around uh, environmental rule of law. It has worked with stakeholders, prosecutors, judges, uh, legislators, it has engaged uh, partners like the IUCN World Commission on Environmental Law, the Organization of American States and many others around the world uh, to uh, better define what we mean by environmental rule of law and build the capacity of all stakeholders involved. Uh, the judiciary has been a big focus of this work and the Global Judicial Institute for the Environment, um, I tend to view as a, as a result of this growing uh, recognition for, uh, for the need uh, to have more environmental rule of law worldwide. The Global Judicial Institute for the Environment provides a unique opportunity, and when uh, judges and all other stakeholders uh, gathered for the first um, environmental rule of law congress uh, in Rio de Janeiro in 2016, they try to define uh, a bit more the boundaries of environmental rule of law. And um, there it was very clear that there are certain aspects of environmental rule of law that perhaps uh, uh, complement uh, the uh, more natural understanding of the rule of law. What are these additional qualities that one can ascribe to environmental rule of law? Well, first, uh, there is uh, the intergenerational aspect. Uh, this is, of course, an integral part to uh, sustainable development. And if you want fair, just, sustainable development, uh, then one also has to take the intergenerational aspect into account. So I would say this is the first aspect uh, that perhaps is an additional, a unique element uh, that, uh, that makes up environmental rule of law. The second aspect I would tend to think is that often judges and stakeholders dealing with environmental rule of law have to deal with scientific uncertainty. They may be confronted with a scenario where the science is not 100% settled, where the science is not 100% clear. This is expressed in the precautionary approach, precautionary principle, but uh, this, this Congress uh, in, in Rio de Janeiro in 2016 also took uh, account of a emerging principle that largely comes out of uh, uh, judiciaries around the world, and that is in dubio pro natura, which essentially means when in doubt, err on the side of nature, err on the side of uh, the environment, to account for this uh, scientific uncertainty that might have to be uh, encountered and, and have to be factored in. The last uh, unique aspect I would like to mention is uh, that uh, environmental rule of law has a progressive element built into it. Uh, there is the sentiment in many judicial uh, decisions around the world uh, that uh, environmental law should not backslide, that the protections for the environment should not be reduced over time. In other words, they should progressively uh, increase and uh, the protection of the environment uh, should uh, be made uh, more uh, uh, robust and more, more sensible over time. Uh, these, uh, these aspects, I feel, make uh, environmental rule of law uh, special. And if one contrasts this with uh, uh, what the uh, violations of environmental law uh, do in the field of sustainable development, how they can uh, impact whether or not we are able to achieve a uh, just and fair uh, sustainable development, and if we are able to protect uh, the most vulnerable, I think it's clear to see uh, that we need to increase uh, the work uh, that we put into environmental rule of law and that we need to increase the capacity of all, of all stakeholders uh, involved. More than half of the countries in the world guarantee their citizens now the right to a clean, healthy, safe environment. And uh, the litmus test for environmental rule of law going forward will clearly be to give meaning uh, to these provisions. 
Um, that links back, of course, to uh, human rights overall and the, the uh, ability of the international community to achieve uh, human rights. Um, the international community has to catch up with this uh, development at the national level and has yet to recognize uh, that uh, uh, there is a human right to the environment, but it is very clear to see uh, that uh, very traditional classical human rights like the right to life, the right to health, the right to housing, uh, they are very intricately associated with uh, the quality of uh, the natural environment and the ability of uh, uh, societies to live in a, a healthy and safe environment. How do we make sure that uh, these rights become reality and uh, they don't only exist on paper, but they actually deliver uh, the results for people and the planet. Uh, UN Environment, as I've said, has uh, built a whole program around uh, environmental rule of law and uh, we are uh, sensitizing the judiciary, sensitizing legislators, sensitizing prosecutors, sensitizing the entire uh, enforcement community and all stakeholders involved around environmental rule of law uh, to make sure uh, that uh, there is more environmental rule of law, that there is more accountability before the law and that uh, uh, the um, environmental laws that we have in place can actually deliver uh, the results uh, for uh, people and uh, the planet. This will be the great uh, litmus test, as I have said, uh, going forward. And we hope uh, the international community will join uh, forces to uh, build more capacity around environmental rule of law and uh, create a stronger investment into environmental rule of law. Um, I want to uh, conclude perhaps uh, by saying that if we manage to achieve that, uh, then uh, we will have more peaceful societies um, over 40% uh, of all internal conflicts over the past 60 years have had a link uh, to environment and natural resources. So it is very important to recognize this linkage and through uh, uh, increasing awareness and capacities around the world uh, to improve environmental rule of law, we can help uh, societies to become more peaceful. Um, we can make a huge headway in terms of uh, making sure that the sustainable development that we're all aiming for is just and fair. Uh, without environmental rule of law, uh, this development will be arbitrary. Uh, it will be uh, intransparent. Um, there is a likelihood that certain parts of society will not uh, be brought along on this journey and that people will be left behind and uh, the, the overarching ambition, of course, of sustainable development is to leave nobody behind. And in order to get that done, in order to achieve that, we need a more environmental rule of law. And lastly, human rights, the realization of human rights uh, will be greatly hampered uh, if we don't invest more in environmental rule of law, if we don't invest more in the institutions uh, that uh, are implementing uh, environmental laws, that are designing environmental laws to make sure that these laws are adequate, adequate also in the perspective of uh, helping uh, people to uh, realize uh, their uh, uh, more classical, more traditional human rights. But uh, these human rights, all human rights, are uh, very intricately linked uh, to the environment. Environmental rights are human rights, human rights are environmental rights. There is no clear way of dividing uh, these two areas. And so uh, going forward, we really need to, as an international community, and UN Environment has pledged to do this in partnership uh, with, uh, with a broad coalition, of, of partners, we need to make sure uh, that we uh, mainstream these thoughts across the whole uh, uh, gamut of stakeholders that have a stake in the rule of law uh, to make sure that the environment is a critical part of it. Um, cognizant of the fact, of course, that environmental rule of law, as I have mentioned, is unique in the sense that it deals with uh, the natural environment, it deals with uh, natural resources and because of that uh, there are unique, unique factors that need to be taken into account. And um, hopefully 
in, in, in going forward with this effort, uh, we can make sure also that we measure how well we are doing uh, when it comes to environmental rule of law and uh, that we provide mechanisms for uh, citizens to be a part of this conversation that nobody is left behind. Uh, this is, of course, the again, the democratic expression of the environmental rule of law, uh, that there is access to information, environmental information, that is very important. That's the first step we have to make sure. Uh, there needs to be public participation that, again, these laws are not uh, concocted uh, in, in, in private chambers, but there is an opportunity for stakeholders uh, to share their views, uh, to participate in the decision-making process, and that ultimately, if there are environmental disputes, uh, that uh, there is access to justice, uh, so that we can uh, help uh, people everywhere uh, in the fair and just distribution of environmental benefits and burdens. If we achieve all of that, at the end of the day, we will be better off. Environmental law will be able to um, yield the benefits uh, for people and the planet, and we will have a sustainable development that is fair, that is uh, just, and uh, we will be um, increasingly making progress in achieving peace and security, as well as uh, guaranteeing and achieving uh, human rights uh, for, for everybody on this planet. Thank you very much.